All right, um, so let's start uh, with uh, design of green roofs and the uh, perception, the wisdom of uh, design as it's expressed in um, presentations and, and uh, how, how that gets developed. Um, so let me see. Ed, you were mentioning that uh, a lot of times the, um, the way a design is um, perceived or presented is somewhat simplistic or naive or doesn't reflect the full reality of the of the project? Well, I think that I think what you see out in the marketplace is an assumption of ecosystem services being delivered from a green roof. And some of those, to my mind, seem to be in conflict with one another. And I don't know that plant selection is um, um, is necessarily um, map to that at all. Um, so I think you get, I guess there's a split in the marketplace that Linda and I wrote about that we have a design solution that's possible for a green roof or we have a product solution. So there's a marketplace for saying a certain sales force can come and say, well, we'll install a green roof and of course you get all these services and they just kind of plop in place. Um, and and I guess it, it comes full circle around it. We haven't really done the in situ field research to validate any of that. So I, I think we can see that there's plant survival or not plant survival. I'm not so sure that we're smart enough to know which plants, which soils, which assemblies are going to maximize or optimize those perceived ecosystem services. Some of the uh, uh, early developments in um, green roofs in Germany, I noticed, because of all the incentives and the push to get green roofs installed there, uh, created a lot of, um, uh, initially, a lot of sort of slipshod installations uh, because of the lack of available research available, the lack of available uh, uh, knowledge bases for, for mm -hmm. green roofs. And I, I see that happening in certain places in the U.S. as well, in North America as well, uh, where there's a green roof required by the design, whether it's a public works project, and they said we need a green roof. There's such a push to get the green roof in there that the understanding of what the green roof can do and how it will develop is um, not as important to the client as just getting it up there. Have you experienced that, Charlie, uh, in in your in your uh, rather vast experience at doing uh, green roofs in the U.S. North America? Oh, I, yeah. I think there's a lack of uh, curiosity on the part of most clients <coughs> uh, that are simply uh, that, that start from the standpoint of, of simply having to put up a green. Um, and so that means that uh, the opportunities to have uh, uh, a dialogue with them about what they want it to look like in five years and what expect expectations they have, uh, what the implications are for maintenance and ongoing management uh, to achieve what they want. Um, those sorts of discussions don't happen because the, uh, in many cases what's being provided is seen as a product um, that once installed um, continues to deliver um, what's promised, uh, you know, with, without active intervention. Um, so uh, th there's another client group, of course, which is very specific about what they want, um, and uh, those clients uh, need to be really given a range of options so that they can choose the most uh, effective approach uh, for for what they're looking for. The big drivers that I've seen in the market are stormwater retention, but that's starting to grow now. Uh, well, I'd, expand rather. Well, I would say uh, that, that, that the, the industry depends upon stormwater uh, 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 management and regulation of stormwater management as a driver to grow the industry. Um, uh, however, um, I'm sorry, I've lost the train of thought. Um, never mind. Well, that's Somebody else. Putting the door to getting a broader array of services out of out of green roofs, and I imagine living walls eventually. 
Um, but even now they're doing they're doing um, you know living walls for interior you know air cleaning, uh, fire remediation uses. Um, uh, but what I see happening more and more now, uh, in the literature at least, is uh, people advertising things like hab habitat support, uh, food production, um, a little bit more on the energy side, looking at uh, uh, the cooling reduction, uh, the, the, the cooling load reduction on buildings. Um, but still, stormwater has been the big driving thing that's been uh, uh, what instituted in all of the incentives usually city incentives more than county or state uh, incentives. Um, um, okay. Uh, 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 the point I was going to make earlier is that uh, these, uh, these issues around regulation of stormwater in particular certainly are absolutely critical for the growth of the industry. However, most of the projects that we see built are, or many of the projects we see built are outside municipalities that have any kind of in-place regulation of any consequence. And, and uh, I would say that um, a lot of projects that are getting built are about aesthetics and about um, uh, some of these uh, philosophical concepts that have to do with um, habitat creation or um, energy uh, reduction and things of that sort. Um, and uh, uh, those are the projects which are often not really um, carefully thought through in terms of what the objectives of the client are and how best to deliver a project which is going to satisfy their, their needs, their objectives, their desires, and also be affordable. The, one of the things I noticed uh, in design processes for green roofs was that one way to design a green roof is to look at a particular set of, um, uh, you know, say what you have available on your on your roof to hold the weight of the of the of the green roof up, and um, selecting your plants and media, etc., to accommodate those restrictions. Another way to design is to find out what plants you need to achieve a certain result, and design a. Uh, uh, an ecology or a habitat for them and a maintenance plan to keep those pl those particular plants active. A particular example of this is phytoremediation where you've got plants that will target certain toxins that you want to remove from water or soil or whatever. And um, even though there might be a, um, a pressure to have species succession, that pressure is resisted by the maintenance plan that keeps the original species selection intact. Uh, Robert, you've done some research on phytoremediation, and uh, I know that uh, Dr. Cameron has also done some at Penn State. Um, could you go through a little bit of some of the non uh, some of the non stormwater uh, applications and research going into green, green roofs? I, well, from a phytoremediation standpoint, I mean you can view a green roof like you would any other. Um, planting that you're going to use for that, that kind of a system, um, like a rain garden or, or anything else where you're, you're going to dump uh, contaminated water and expect the uh, materials to take the plant material and or the soil to treat that. Um, and, and you can design a system that's effective, but kind of, kind of back to what Ed was saying a minute ago about um, design and where you started this whole conversation out. Um, I, I agree with Ed and Charlie that one of the biggest problems is, is that we have this sort of one-size-fits-all design mentality. And so you know, you're bringing up the idea of phytoremediation. Well, a phytoremediation roof is going to be a very, very different animal than something that's being put up there strictly for stormwater management. And um, to think that, you know, all you have to do is change the plant palette a little bit and, uh, you know, maybe make the soil six inches deep or the media six inches deep instead of uh, four inches deep and you're going to call it a phytoremediation roof is uh, probably a bit naive. Um, Certainly, there's going to have to be a lot of different maintenance practices, one being harvesting the plant material specifically, because if you're trying to remove uh, contaminants, especially metals or anything like that, I mean, you can't make them go away. The only way to get rid of them is to harvest the plant material and remove them that way. Sure. I, I just a, a side question. I had a professor that uh, told me one time, he said, a burden shifted is not a burden lifted. And with phytoremediation, it's a good example of that. Um, has there been a lot of work on what you do after you harvest the plant materials that have, um, say, hyperaccumulated, you know, uh, metals 
Typically what you do is you burn them, and then you concentrate the, um, the material that's left over. Um, so, so you can actually harvest things. Um, there, there have been uh, examples of um, people growing, say, sunflower in a field that was contaminated and harvesting the heavy metals back out of the, uh, the sunflower tissue. And long term, that's probably going to be uh, something that we can do with uh, some contaminated sites. I don't really see green roofs falling into this very much, though. Um, we're starting out with a relatively non-contaminated system, and the rainfall that's falling on it is, is contaminated, but it's not heavily contaminated. It's not like a, a post-industrial brownfield site where you've got heavy amounts or large amounts of, of industrial metals and things that you're trying to clean up. I mean, we shouldn't really ever be dealing with that on a green roof, unless it's specifically designed to treat waste from a factory. Mm -hmm. Well, Patrick, I would say that in green roof plant selection, there's there's somewhat of a hierarchical relationship. I mean, first, the, the plant has to live long enough to perform its function. So a lot of the field research that's been done on plants for whatever whatever ecosystem service, the first thing you have to do is build the assembly so you have um, a, a long-term plant survival, or at least something alive, uh, because it, it, generally dead plants don't perform many services. Um, as a rule, and they would, um, you know, I think the, the kind of thumbnail back of the envelope calculations are a green roof returns its investment somewhere in the 20 to 30 year mark, and so if you're up every four or five years replacing plants and doing all that, you you may never get to your return on investment. Um, and there there is a, there's not a long-term view of this. It's a, it's a Dumb as a day of installation view. Uh, like Rob said, there's an oversimplification of plant pallets per region, per design intent, per ecosystem service. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a homogenization of plants and soils. Um, and I'm I'm not saying that those don't do some good. I'm just saying we don't we don't currently play around with it enough to optimize it or really observe it in the field for any length of time. And maybe it hasn't been enough time. You know, maybe we're right where we should be because we're essentially a 10-year-old market. <laughs> I remember some of the studies, uh, there was one study in particular out of Penn State, I believe it was Penn State, that talked about um, the monitoring of uh, uh, how well a green roof um, retains stormwater over an extended period of time. Uh, you know, as the roots of the plants developed, as the soil changed, etc., and the efficiency of the roof actually wound up increasing somewhat um, over time. Uh, and I, 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 as I recall, the explanation for that was that as the roots developed, um, it allowed more surface area to be available to water flow through the roof. And as a result, there was more adhesion uh, taking place um, in, the, in, the, like in the soil. So it's, it's not just a, an issue of what particular plants are going to serve a particular purpose. It's the whole system develops like a, like an animal would develop. You know, there's a lifespan and a, and a change of capacity as it uh, uh, is given birth, grows into adolescence, grows into uh, uh, you know middle age, late middle age, and then where we all are right now. Um, <laughs> so well, I think that, I think that's especially true with stormwater quality, where you see a lot of the studies from universities. They, they install a green roof and then pour water over it, and they, they extract data that's, you know, that's, that's true at that particular point in time. Very few people have gone to a five- or six-year-old green roof and looked at stormwater quality because it's going to look very different, I would imagine. Rob would know better than I, but I can't imagine. I think the initial kind of it's the same as the first flush. You're going to get a lot of humic acid, acid and a lot of nutrient flow off a of freshly installed roof. Yeah, this, this, yeah, the, 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 uh, the nutrient content initially when you start out with all that compost that we put into the media and the, the starter fertilizer charge uh, compared to something that's older. Um, eventually, it's, it, it comes down to management practices, though, in terms of water quality especially. Um, if you fertilize the roof heavily, you're going to have fertility coming off the roof all the time. Um, if you don't fertilize it heavily, it's going to be reduced. Um, but there's a trade-off between having sufficient fertility to keep the roof alive and 
to not encourage the growth of undesirable species because there's nothing there for the desirable species to use, um, and and the water quality issue. And I think I think it's one of the places you know in terms of, of hype and in terms of um, stories that are out there that are probably not really quite true. Um, you know we, we can't have runoff from the green roof have no nutrients in it. I mean that's just not possible. You have to have nutrients in the system to keep the plants alive. Um, it can be minimized and it can be managed, um, but the runoff from a green roof is never going to be as clean as the rainwater that hits it. It's just not going to happen. Well, I think that's what I was speaking of at first, where you have conflicting ecosystem services there. If, if, you're, if you're in an area with some sort of high atmospheric deposition that you want to manage with a roof, you're going to have to keep the soil lean enough and find a group of plants that can live in extremely lean soils but they may not be high in nectar and pollen value, and so you may have a very low habitat roof. Or they, it may not be that ornamental and nice to look at. And I, I think the assumption is that these roofs do all these things all the time. Some of the most stable roofs that we've, that we've seen um, are ones that have very low aesthetic value, <laughs> but actually look like, and you showed some pictures of tundra, Ed, in, in your, uh, in your mm -hmm. slides, but they're, um, I've seen, uh, we, uh, we have some roofs up that are, um, you see a lot of open ground, open aggregate, uh, where there's, they're, they're so lean and so drought tolerant that uh, you have little spots of plants here and there, and the roots are holding the, the soil together, but it doesn't look li anything like a garden, anything like a fully vegetated um, uh, area. But it, it functions well in terms of runoff and uh, uh, contaminants from the runoff. But the aesthetic part of it is just not what you what the what what, what the client would originally envision. Um, well, this, this this goes to having a discussion with the client at the outset in terms of what their objectives are. Um, uh, uh, you can certainly, and we advocate uh, active management of roofs to to maintain an aesthetic and also to uh, uh, refresh the biodiversity of the system and make it something which is, is beautiful and uh, uh, interesting um, as well as meeting the bare requirements of providing you know, some sort of treatment, uh, you know, some sort of you know, media on, on the roof. And that's the sort of discussion very few people have with their clients. Um, and uh, it results in surprises um, uh, that, uh, that ideally would be avoided in, in, a, in a proper design process. I find it interesting when you, when you talk to a client about, uh, well, do you, do you plan on uh, maintaining uh, your landscape for your project, meaning the landscape at, at grade? They'll say, well, of course. And what's your what's your maintenance plan for your roof? And it's almost as though they think it's a different topic. Oh, the roof is there. Well, that's taken care of. But we have to pay a lot more attention to the to the plants at grade because we associate maintenance with that. But what I what I found is that a number of roofs, the ones that have won international design awards, <laughs> etc., are being redesigned either by Mother Nature or by the maintenance staff as they as they develop. And um, which is interesting. I, Ed uh, brought up a, a number of issues when I had conversations with him about, about maintenance, maintenance regimes, um, and the fact that um, plants have lifespans. I mean, even if you have uh, perennials, it doesn't mean that every perennial is going to last forever. You have uh, uh, certain perennials will live longer than others. Some will seed, self seed, some won't. And so a, a roof. It's like a marriage. Once you get the green roof in there, you're committed to uh, a maintenance relationship with it in some way. Um, Ed, could you talk a little bit about uh, post-installation maintenance issues as they relate to the long-term history of a green roof? Well, I think you have to think about maintenance toward the design because uh, it's a financial commitment and a time commitment and an expertise commitment. So if if you're, say, let's say you're, you're a facilities director for a college or university, you would want to know in the design process what assets you have to bring to bear to this roof. Now, 
a real successful example of that is Swarthmore University outside Philadelphia, where they have two or three people on staff now that have gone, become very excited about the green roofs, and they have an idea how they want to maintain them. And, and they really manage those roofs with a plan. And as they build more roofs, they are pushing their maintenance plan up through the design process. And I think that that's the ideal state that comes from, um, you know, living with, they have lived with green roofs and seen, okay, we've got this freely self-sowing native grass. Maybe we don't want that in the spec the next time because it's starting to occupy too much of the roof and cost us too much time. Uh, you know, on the, po on the plus side, it is a nice native grass and it may provide a service, but we're, we're out of, outside of our time budget to control this thing on the roof and we don't want it to be 100% grass roof. So they're kind of going through that experience and then staying to the next, as they keep adding buildings in their portfolio, they are using their maintenance experience to uh, inform their design choices. And I think that's, that's an interesting path. And, and let's face it, we're not going to get many of our ecosystem services from roofs unless we have them at a fairly significant scale. So the campus environment, whether it's a city or a college or a corporate campus, they're going to need a lot of buildings with green roofs, and they're going to have to start informing their designers through their experience. Rob, how old is research in North America on green roofs? I mean, how, um, how old are some of the older roofs that um, are being examined and uh, researched? Well, the oldest roofs we have on campus are some little garden sheds that are about 10 or 12 years old now, I guess. Um, and that's the oldest research roof in North America that I'm aware of. Most of the roofs that people are playing around with are five years old or less, uh, mm -hmm. maybe six or seven. And even the ones I'm playing around with on our campus, most of the, the large-scale roofs um, are much younger. Um, I would get back to Ed's comment though about, um, you know, and, and yours too, about the landscape issue. Um, you know, I, I think it's naive to think that a roof as a landscape is any different than the same landscape on the ground. I mean, if I planted a sedum meadow or a sedum carpet on the ground as part of our arboretum, I would expect to do some maintenance to maintain that sedum meadow. Uh, and, and I would also expect it to change over time. I mean, we just we put in an arboretum uh, at grade here at Penn State a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the plants that you put in there are basically a starter set, um, but it's going to change over time. And, and if you don't actively change it over time, it's going to change over time by itself. Um, I mean, that's just going to happen. I find, too, that in the absence of direction, uh, the maintenance staff will sometimes take over the design responsibilities of the roof. And uh, I know several award-winning roofs in my area uh, where uh, the maintenance staff is actually redesigning the roof. Uh, they find species that were originally selected that are no longer appropriate or no longer working. And uh, you know, with or without doing research, they'll come in with their alternatives. Uh, I've seen the same thing with, with homeowners that just start <laughs> you know, saying, oh, this is sort of neat. I, w I went to, the, I went to home, home Depot and got a seed packet. Let's see what works and throws it up there, which I, interesting experiments. Uh, but they don't frequently don't have a lot of scientific rigor behind them. Um, you know, we do that on campus, though. I mean, I have my green roof class every year plant some new plants up on the roof, and uh, I mean, we deliberately pick things that some are going to die out and some may survive, and some. Um, I mean, you think about managing a roof for aesthetic purposes. I mean, we deliberately plant annuals up there every year on the ones that are, are highly visible, um, simply because you can't get that that level of color from anything that's going to be up there perennially, and. That way we can fill in the holes. So, sure. you know, it's all about it's all about the management and the maintenance and what it is you expect the thing to look like. And, and you know, it's the same thing that we do with all the at-grade landscapes. I, mean, I, I don't view a green roof as being significantly different from a landscape standpoint than the same thing at grade. Sure. Um, here's a question for all of you. I'd like to talk a little. We, we've gone pretty much into the what 40 minutes or whatever that we're going to be edited down to. Um, in the time remaining, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, appropriate uh, uh, training and educational development uh, that has to be brought to bear uh, for this topic, whether it's design, installation, maintenance, uh, or research. Um, suggestions, experiences about um, uh, 
you know, strong points and weak points and what's available in terms of expertise in the field and uh, training and education in the field. You want me to start there? Hey, I'll run my mouth if there's a silence. I get nervous, so... Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I'd rather have you talk, though. I'll start on that one. Um, I think the makeup of this panel is a pretty good indication of the kind of expertise that you want to have to have a successful green roof. I mean, you need some... Gary. Horticulture, the uh, the plant physiology, the uh, soils. Um, you need someone who knows what plants grow where and and how to grow them where they are. And you need someone who's doing the engineering to keep, because it's actually on a roof. And um, I think there's a disconnect in the training. I mean, I certainly see it with you know like our landscape architecture program. I mean, they they know how to design something and it's very pretty, but there's not a lot of uh, interest in or understanding of of the soils or anything else underneath it, or, or the the system function underneath it. So, you know, I mean, I, I see that with roofs a lot, where the landscape architect will come in and, and specify a plant palette, and it's lovely and it's wonderful, and it provides all kinds of great ecosystem services. But they haven't talked to the engineer, and they don't know what needs to go on below that. And they haven't talked to the soil scientist, and they don't know what needs to go on below that. So it's really kind of a marriage of a lot of different areas. How is the how? Oh yeah, sorry, go on. Well, I, I just say that, that there, every group, uh, and we've done hundreds of them, um, is its own creature. Um, and to think that you can uh, take a course or um, uh, abstractly uh, you know, learn the lessons of green roof design and maintenance is, is false. Uh, we learn from every single project and we continue to. Um, I mean, fundamentally, uh, you have to make a commitment to each one of these projects and follow them and, and adapt with them. Because no matter how smart you think you are about anticipating issues of drainage and, and soil uh, uh, properties and plant selection and microclimate, uh, anticipating microclimates, uh, you are going to be surprised. And uh, the more projects you are physically on, and have and and have your preconceptions demolished time and time again. Um, uh, the more reliable you're going to be as an advisor to a client, and and the better you're going to be at being able to intervene and turn uh, uh, you know, guide the process of, of the development of these projects. Well, uh, Patrick, I would just add, I think Charlie's exactly right, and Rob's exactly right. I think ultimately, if you want to look at a future state of, of what would be a certificate of expertise or something like that, it would eventually have to in include a practicum of some kind. But you could demonstrate in the classroom a fundamental knowledge of terminology, of, of field conditions, hypothetical, but uh, just like a doctor or a dentist, you know, or you know, you would you would want someone with field experience eventually. I don't know how you put that through a pipe and, and run it through an organization, but, um, you know, you we don't really have in the U.S. in the landscape and horticulture trades uh, um, a, uh, like a trade, trade schools like they do in the rest of the world. So our people that come into the field don't come through practicums most of the time. They come through academic experience, and it is humbling. Um, and I've seen it from working in nurseries for a long time. The people that come out of college are sure that what they've learned is correct, and then they hit the cold reality of the nursery. And and uh, and I think the supply chain also has to learn, because I'm not sure all the products and materials are equal. And so there's there's if you want to be qualified to pick those, you have to really understand those individual constituent materials and then how they fit together in the field. And there's, there's no way to understand that in the abstract. No, I agree. Uh, it's, it strikes me that when you generally in four-year university education, the, uh, the leaning is toward the, the white-collar design-oriented kind of uh, knowledge base, whereas through the trades or even in some aspects with community colleges, it's much more toward the application, uh, like emphasis. I don't know a lot of pro. The only program I know of in North America 
is at BCIT that has successive uh, British Columbia Institute of Technology that has um, something like six different courses all related to green roofs at, that are different levels. Usually like at Rob's, like at Penn State, I believe there's like one one, one, one course that generally supplements some other discipline like landscape architecture or horticulture or something. Um, and uh, I, it's, it's interesting. I know coming from architecture, uh, the only thing we ever learned about plants was how to scribble them in in presentation drawings uh, to you know, soften the hard edges of the, of the planes that we were designing. Um, but the, 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 the soil is, to me, uh, it's, it winds up being the, the big, um, what, the rocket science of uh, the industry. That and the horticulture. Um, what do you think would, uh, in, in training, in doing the, the GRP classes through Green Nurse or Healthy Cities, the 101 through 401, um, most of the people that take those take it from the standpoint of try to reinforce something they al a discipline they already know. So for instance, the horticulture people will really focus on the horticulture part of that training, but look forward to delegating the roof membrane stuff to somebody else because that's uh, that's part of the that's their 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 their, their thing. Um, do you see in the do as a group? Do you guys see in the in the future uh, green roof living wall um, design and research um, encompassing more and more fields, but also getting to the point where there might be a a higher stratum of accreditation, I guess you'd call it. Um, you all come from different disciplines. I mean, Charlie comes from soil. Ed comes from plants. Rob, I'm not quite sure you're about your your horticulture, basically, right? Is that that's your that's your background? Um, I know that originally people like Kelly Luckett came from roofing. Um, I, I, I I'm still really intrigued at. Uh, how we can move to the next level of green roof understanding for a professional designation level beyond just um, taking one course or taking a, getting a, a GRP certificate, which we all know is relatively, it's more like a, a GED than a PhD. Um, I have to argue along with Charlie that um, it, it's all really about experience beyond that book learning. I mean, you can learn that stuff, but um, it, it, well, for example, in horticulture at Penn State, if you're getting a degree in horticulture, you have to do at least one internship with um, some business related to what it is that you want to do. And that might be with somebody like Charlie or for some of my students, it might be at a greenhouse or a nursery or a landscape company. Um, but there's no substitute for actually being out there and getting your hands dirty. I mean, you, you can read about this stuff all day long, but you're not going to see it. And the more actual field experience you get, better you're going to be at it. So, I mean, I guess if I were going to take the uh, certification practices up another level, it would be to require that someone have a certain number of years or a certain number of projects of field experience um, behind or underneath their belt before they could get that next level of certification. What do you see the relationship between the design professionals and the uh, installation professionals uh, in the field? On projects, and mostly here, I'm talking about commercial projects, large, large projects. Uh, I, I would say one of the things that is a truth on virtually every project we do is that what you encounter in the field is always different than what's on the drawing, um, and uh, uh, and uh, even if what's on the drawing is accurate, there are conditions that uh, are a surprise. Um, and that the actual reality of the space that you're encountering when you start building a project is different than the abstraction that comes from the design process. Um, there are very few uh, designers um, which follow their process through the, uh, uh, through the, the, the field adjustments and, and myriad decisions that go into actually building a workable project. Um, and I think that that is um, a limitation imposed by the way we do design in this country. Um, 
and I think it's uh, important that designers uh, are more present in the field, and, uh, and, and unless they can take back to their desks um, the knowledge of seeing, you know, what happens at uh, certain sorts of transitions and how drainage is affected and uh, how uh, different sorts of wind and exposure conditions affect the design, uh, it's not going to result in an improvement uh, over time in, in design. Charlie, are you suggesting that designers should be uh, dragged, kicking, and screaming back to previous projects? <laughs> I think designers should, out of their own interest, want to go back and see these projects. But um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, I think you can, I, I think particularly uh, in, in, a, in a, a field which uh, the margins between success and failure are so narrow. Uh, we're dealing with extreme environments to begin with, which means small, um, small decisions made about certain variables, about uh, types of drainage and um, types of plants and thickness of soil and irrigation or not irrigating or uh, placement near a window and on and on and on. Um, uh, small, seemingly small decisions have large impacts. And those are usually dealt with in practice by making a field adjustment. As you say, the person that's doing the management of the project uh, over a period of time uh, may accommodate the realities of, of, the, uh, of the actual installation and may participate in sort of redesigning it, re-engineering it to more, be more adapted to, the, to its actual environment, uh, which means that uh, a lot of these projects five years out um, have departed very far from the design intent of the original designers. Um, and uh, we can just accept that as a reality, or uh, we can encourage, um, through whatever means, to have uh, uh, landscape design professionals which are invested in, in uh, both uh, observing and participating in installation of these projects, but also tracking them. Mm -hmm. It's been my experience, too, that landscape professionals um, have traditionally been drawn upon not to have uh, their, their products be so, uh, what, um, mechanically tied to the performance of a structure. Landscaping has generally been other kinds of things, what, usually aesthetic, but when you get to the point where you have to come up with certain stormwater retention performance on a roof or certain other kinds of performances on a roof, those criteria are rarely shared at the, at, at grade level. Well, now, I, I just like the, There are like exceptions the, with regard to bioswales and yeah. the rain gardens and stuff like uh, that. But. I, I just like to make one comment about performance with regard to stormwater, and that is, uh, you know, we're, we, we've given lip service to green roofs being uh, an important uh, um, uh, uh, part of our current uh, design vocabulary because of their perceived importance in stormwater management. However, um, there is a very, very low level of sophistication in terms of actually understanding how green roofs perform hydraulically and hydrologically, and frankly, very little interest in filling that gap. So uh, it's interesting that the regulations which do exist uh, around stormwater management make certain primitive assumptions, most of which are only partly true, and um, uh, many of which, or all of which, uh, are likely not ever to be tested. And this not only is about green roofs, this also pertains to ground BMP low impact development measures, right? It's expensive to find out the truth. It's easier to have a uh, uh, sort of a, a gentleman's agreement among designers and engineers and regulators that we will assume certain things and, uh, and that becomes the basis of design. So, I mean, if we're talk really talking about design here, uh, uh, that's a different animal than sort of working inside this regulatory environment, which is more about, um, um, uh, is, is not so interested, actually, right, in yeah. getting to the bottom of the science. Uh, we have a, a few more minutes left. Um, in that time, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, 
what you think is uh, what we all, you know, as a group, but what we all think is uh, are the most uh, the areas of in need of the most development in terms of our knowledge and understanding of uh, of, of green roofs, whether it's from the standpoint of areas of research that are being neglected or getting short shrifted, um, areas of training. Um, you know, where should if we had to. Uh, Put out some put out some fires. Where would we put them out now? Okay, areas what? of research, subjects of research. Do, what do you what? want me to start? Sure. There you go, Ed. Uh, well, I mean, from my perspective as a nurseryman, what I would like to see is this. There, there's kind of a, a a dual untruth right now, and that's that sedums work on all roofs. And that sedums are ecological deserts. You have you have two very vocal camps that, that vilify sedums, and then another camp that uses them universally. And I think it shows that the the local, regional, and and uh, service understanding of the horticulture on green roofs is very low. So um, I think as knowledge rises, those two perceptions will tend to bleed away uh, because we'll have true understanding in each particular climate, microclimate, or design intent about plant performance. And uh, that's not going to be learned except by going on roofs and having Rob students punch in some plant that someone says, I think this will work, and everyone else says no, or, or watching what the wind blows in, or, I mean, it's an observational science. And then it's got to run through production horticulture and make sure you can produce it at, um, at a reasonable price where someone's going to buy it. Uh, and then assemble it with other components in, with enough expertise in the field that the poor plant has a choice. So I, I would like to see a, a lot more horticulture look. Uh, Rob, in terms of uh, research, where do you think the big gaps are? Well, I mean, I think one of the clear problems is is we have this concept of uh, the media and one size fits all and we're going to put one green roof media on a roof at any given depth of soil and it's going to support all these different plants. Um, I, we don't do that in the landscape. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're landscaping an area, you're going to look at the different soil types and you're going to select plant material that's adapted to the soil type because that's going to provide you with better success long term. I, mean, I think we need to get to that level of sophistication on the green roof, too, in terms of matching media to plant selection, media depth to plant selection, what Charlie was saying, drainage um, components on the roof to your plant palette and plant design, too. And I think that's one of the places where the design really breaks down is that, you know, we're all designing or we're designing these things sort of in isolation from the other components of the roof. I mean, the plant materials are being selected, and if, if they're doing any kind of, of uh, you know, thinking about the design, I mean, their, their response is just to change the media depth from four inches to six inches to support the different plants. Well, you know, I mean, I guess that works, but it's not really at the level of sophistication that we need to be at if you really want to design a roof to have a, a, a wide biodiversity and, and maintain that biodiversity over time. Sure. It was interesting when, you, when uh, I believe Ed was talking about um, uh, taking into account the the maintenance implications of every plant you have on your palate and uh, decide, deciding not only that but what it, what, what does it need to thrive and what what is it going to need to uh, uh, develop throughout its life lifespan on the roof in terms of yeah, maintenance I had a, a few years back about it, you know I mean if you really want a diversity of, of plant communities on a roof you need a diversity of soils on the roof or a diversity of media on the roof mm -hmm. um, because the two go hand in hand and we don't do that. I mean, the roof is all one media, and, and all we change is depth and maybe a little bit of the subsurface drainage components underneath. Um, to wrap up, um, if uh, if we had to isolate or think about some uh, uh, glaringly obvious or glaringly uh, uh, what um, areas of hype within what the naive market would look at a green roof for. Um, where do you think the largest areas of the most glaring hype are right now, currently in the market, where people, uh, where there's, um, yeah, exactly, that's. 
Um, where's the hype right now in the market? Where's the, where's the biggest amount of, um, not outright deception, but exaggeration of claims, uh, vagueness of information uh, now being sort of generally advertised in terms of uh, green roofs as a product? I would agree with Charlie. It's probably on the function of the roof from a stormwater standpoint, and, and I'd also add the function of a roof from an energy standpoint. Um, but the models are, especially from an energy standpoint, a lot of the models are just based on uh, empirical data or someone thinking about what it's going to do, and they're not really based on any kind of research. Um, some of them are. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's... Um, we make a lot of assumptions, and a lot of this from regulatory hype. I mean, I guess it's just regulatory hype rather than anything else, but we make all these assumptions about a four-inch roof is going to hold two inches of water regardless of what the antecedent conditions are, the preceding conditions, uh, you know, regardless of the plant community on the roof, the health of the plant community, everything else that's going on, we still say it's going to hold two, two inches of water every time it rains, and of course that's not really true. One of the things that I've seen... And not only in the trades, but also in the design professions, is that um, there is a, uh, a lack of willingness to, for one design professional or one trade to put themselves in the shoes of another. Even though we've been at Green Roofs for a while, um, the people that want to see mechanical performance in terms of stormwater still don't want to understand or try to understand the horticulture better. Um, the people that are doing the waterproof membrane still don't really want to get interested too much in the horticultural aspects of it. Um, that uh, green roofs are still viewed by a lot of uh, uh, designers as um, uh, a building component like drywall or bricks or, or steel columns versus something that's living that will evolve. Um, well, if, if, if your business is selling soil, you're going to be interested in soil. If it's, uh, it's selling waterproofing, it's going to be waterproofing. If it's plants, it's going to be plants. So it's uh, forgivable that uh, people provide the elements that go into a green roof are focused on what generates revenue for them. Uh, and to the extent possible, not getting in the way, of not letting other aspects of the design get in the way of selling their product. That's perfectly logical and reasonable and, and acceptable. Um, What's lacking, for the most part, uh, in the industry are businesses which are providing uh, not a component, but providing um, a completed installation together with its support over a period of time. Um, there are very few companies like that out there. And that, to me, is the solution to the problem. You want someone who is uh, less interested in, in selling a component, then finding the right component, and then understanding how that component works and learning from its performance and, and working with a client, client over a period of time to, uh, to follow that roof on its trajectory with the understanding that there will be a trajectory, that it's not uh, the, the idea isn't to hold the, the installation in, in place, but to allow it to become what it's going to become in a, in a in an intelligent, uh, uh, active way that results in an outcome everyone's pleased with. Um, and, until, until, uh, until the provider of the system has that mentality that they're providing that kind of a service to the client, um, you're not going to see that many projects where there's this integrated view of green roof design. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm giving a note. I'm, I'm giving a little. I have a little message here that says I have to wrap up soon. So uh, that might be a good time to wrap up. Any last or final or uh, final comments by any anyone on the panel? I would just agree with Charlie that you know. I mean, the problem is that we don't treat them as landscapes. I mean, bottom line is that we're treating the roof as a building. Or what you said too, Patrick. We're treating it as a building element, and it's not. It's a landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much.